Welcome back, everyone. First off, some breaking news. The upper reaches of the Yangtze River are again being hit with heavy rains, and the water levels have been rising quickly. On July 16th, more than 10 homes were flooded in Wanzhou district of Chongqing City, and the city's hydrological monitoring station issued several warnings within three hours. One of the warnings said the water levels at Donghei Wenchan Station in Kaizhou District were expected to rise by 14.1 to 15.7 feet within the next eight hours. And also around the same time, also on July 16th, there were three landslides in that area in Kaizhou District's Dunhao Town. Now, official reports claim that two people were killed and four people were missing, but Chinese data is always you know, not too reliable on this. Now, moving on, Chinese state media were exposed for publishing a fake video of a heroic rescue by Communist Party members. Now, the video shows 15, quote, CCP Party members of a rescue unit of the Chinese Air Force jumping into chest-high water to stop water from being released from the Ganjiang River in Nanchang of Jiangxi. However, the truth of the footage was quickly revealed. It was a video from June showing a practice exercise by a different rescue team in Zhengzhou of Henan in the Enshi Grand Canyon of Hubei. And many Chinese netizens lashed out at these fake reports, calling them shameless. And it was also one recorded previously not related to the current floods. So Chinese netizens were very unhappy about this. And also this shows something else, which is while China is facing these disasters in 27 provinces now, most of China now facing these disasters, top-level CCP officials have not visited any of the major disaster sites. The Chinese Communist Party appears to be desperate to show some footage, something to make the Chinese people feel the CCP is responding to them. And because they don't appear to have any actual videos like this, they had to show a fake video demonstrating this. Now moving on, questions are now growing over which Chinese officials will be sanctioned by the United States next. Now Thank a few, bit of much, background everybody. on this. President Please. Trump on July 14th issued warm. an executive order on Hong Kong. And section four of this order states that, quote, all property and interests in property that are in the United States that hereafter come within the United States or that are or hereafter come within the possession or control of any United States person of the following persons, and it lists a few, are blocked and may not be transferred, paid, exported, withdrawn, or otherwise. And so what does that mean? It means the United States is going after individual Chinese Communist Party leaders who have been involved in human rights abuses, including in Hong Kong and including elsewhere. And these different officials are now worried what, which one of them will be next. Because when it comes to the CCP, it's a system where you rise through power, not through election, but through political correctness. And what does that mean in China? The term comes from 1967 under Mao Zedong. And it means this, if you follow the state party directives, if you follow the directives of the communist party system, you are politically correct. It is a political moral system. And if you go against it, you are not politically correct. If you want to rise in power within the CCP, you need to demonstrate that you're willing to carry out the orders of the CCP. And so many of these Chinese officials have blood on their hands in various regards. And also this White House executive order was followed just a day later by the State Department's announcement of visa restrictions on employees of some Chinese technology companies involved in human rights abuses. Now among those directly named was Chinese telecommunications company Huawei. But Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also said something interesting suggesting this could go beyond even Chinese companies. He said this, quote, Telecommunications companies around the world should consider themselves on notice. If they are doing business with Huawei, they are doing business with human rights abusers. And in addition to this on Hong Kong, after the close to 600,000 Hong Kong residents voted in primary polls for democracy candidates, meaning they stand for, say, Hong Kong autonomy, going against the orders of the CCP, which was seen as a vote against the CCP's new national security laws. Local authorities declared that the vote was illegal, and they're now saying they're launching an investigation into this. Now, they claim the vote was intended as being against the government legislation, which could be a violation of the new national security laws that forbid dissent. And also, authorities followed up on this by claiming the organizer of this, Benny Tai, illegally manipulated the Hong Kong election system and so what do they mean by that? How did he act as a, quote, agent of foreign forces? 
Well, he did that by simply exercising the rights that Hong Kongers used to have until very recently, which is holding a vote saying that they oppose the Chinese Communist Party's national security laws. They oppose the CCP's incursions into Hong Kong, and it's doing away with Hong Kong's autonomy. That's what they're referring to on this. And meanwhile, when it comes to food supplies, China purchased more than 1.7 million tons of U.S. corn, making this the largest single-day sale to China ever, and also the third largest U.S. sale of corn ever. Chinese state-run news outlet Xinhua also reported that China has booked 3 million tons of corn from Ukraine over the past two weeks, and it's now looking at a combined purchase of 6.6 million metric tons of corn. And it also stated on July 15th that China was in the last stages of securing three to five large shipments of U.S. soybeans. And these reports add to speculations of potential food shortages in China as farmlands are being destroyed by these different floods and also as they have locusts moving into the country. And also there are reports of some forms of dissent in China. Chinese residents in a disagreement with Chinese authorities over virus prevention measures engage in a fight with Chinese police. Now, these residents are in a suburb of Beijing, and they recently fought with police about having to pay for new entry passes to their village. These entry passes are part of a new system enacted by the government to monitor people's movements in an effort allegedly to help prevent the spread of the CCP virus, this new coronavirus. Several villagers were detained after the fight, and at least one police officer was injured. Now, videos of these incidents were spread widely after being shared on Chinese social media, but the Chinese news outlets did not report on this incident, and local authorities also did not release any statements on it. Now, these entry passes were introduced after the CCP commission in this town sent out a notice on July 9th, stating that this town has, quote, changed its entry passes. Everybody has to use a new entry pass to enter and leave the village. Anyone who doesn't apply for the pass will be treated as giving up his or her rights to live in our village. And the notice continues, quote, Anyone who passes the checkpoint without the new pass is violating the law and will be held liable. Now, the notice said the new entry pass will cost about 30 yuan, or about $4.29. And if it is lost or damaged, the replacement cost is 100 yuan, about $14.30. All residents had to apply for the pass between July 10th and 13th. And so what are we having right now in Beijing? The Chinese Communist Party has really locked down Beijing. It has really locked down the city in these new measures to allegedly prevent the spread of this new coronavirus. But you also have cases in individual areas where local authorities are placing their own measures. And some of these, such as in this town, are trying to apparently use it for profit, which has been one of the main concerns among many Chinese. And we see that locals in this town are fighting back against police because they need these passes and they have to pay for them if they want to even go to their homes. So there's a few different parts to this. In China, many Chinese people are monitored through every single parts of their lives. They have things like the social credit system, for example, where every purchase you make online, every friend you have, every statement you make on the internet is tracked. And the collection of that data is used to create a profile on you. That profile gives you a citizen score. A high score means you have relative freedom in the country. A low score means you have almost no freedom in the country or face other kinds of punishments. And we see the CCP engaging in various forms of oppressive measures like this in different regards. And when it comes to the CCP virus, this new coronavirus, the CCP has enacted many totalitarian systems to keep the Chinese people locked down. And many Chinese people have been very unhappy with these different measures. And some of them now are fighting back as we're now seeing in the suburb of Beijing. And also when it comes to TikTok, TikTok is of course facing different pressure in the United States and rumors that it may be banned in the United States following in the footsteps of what India has recently done. Now TikTok, this video social media app, is being criticized as having, say, programs within it that would provide data to the Chinese Communist Party. Now, TikTok denies these allegations. It says, for example, that U.S. data is not sent to China, but different evidence has been recently emerging that TikTok is spying on Americans. And there's also concern based on the very fact that it is under a Chinese company. It's run by ByteDance. You might remember a previous episode, we did a whole episode talking about ByteDance, where the head of ByteDance actually came out and wrote a self-criticism letter stating, first off, that he apologized for not following the CCP close enough and said that in the future he would use his company to support the CCP's various directives. And we see now that TikTok is being accused of doing this. And in response to this, as different pressures are being put on TikTok, 
it has now enlisted an army of lobbyists to go and lobby for its own interest to try to, say, fight back against these claims. And in other news, House lawmakers in the U.S. have introduced a bill to address threats posed by the Beijing-run Confucius Institutes. Now, these Confucius Institutes are different institutions run by and paid for by the Chinese Communist Party. Colleges, different academic institutions in the United States receive money from the CCP to, have, to allow the CCP to host these different programs. These are Chinese language and culture programs. And again, as I've mentioned, the problem with them is it is not traditional Chinese culture or language. They're promoting the altered language of the CCP and the altered Chinese culture of the CCP. And the big concern is that the CCP is using these institutions to indoctrinate American youth, to indoctrinate students at American colleges in the interests of the Chinese Communist Party. And now for the broader stories for today. First up, Japan is now positioning itself to challenge the CCP's push to build 5G networks globally. And could also become a new option as many countries have begun to ban Chinese 5G networks. Japan is now developing a new, quote, made in Japan. To challenge the Chinese telecommunications company Huawei, which is a core part of the CCP's One Belt, One Road initiative to expand the Chinese regime's control globally. And as part of this new program, the Japanese government will give $653 million to domestic firms NEC and Fujitsu to develop 5G equipment and networks. Now, a bit more on this. This happens as the UK is imposing a ban on 5G equipment from Huawei, which will begin on December 31st, and will require the UK to remove all existing equipment from Huawei by 2027. Now, Chinese state media were quick to respond to this, saying the UK needs to suffer, quote, public and painful regulations for its decision. So what does this mean? Now, when it comes to 5G, it may be inevitable, right? 5G might be inevitable just because of the way technology is going. Things like smart cars, smart cities, and so on, these next generation technologies would depend on the types of connections 5G would allow. The big question for most of these tech companies, the big question for people interested in this, is which country is going to control the infrastructure. China is pushing very hard right now to control it. And meanwhile, countries are cutting ties with Huawei because they're concerned about possible security issues with it, and also the CCP's intentions. Now, you might remember, in addition to all these other contentions around Huawei, it was recently listed as being connected to the Chinese military, more officially. And amidst all these concerns about what the CCP may be using Huawei for, because again, the mistrust of the CCP is one of the main issues behind this, the Chinese Communist Party, rather than trying to deal with these countries diplomatically, rather than trying to roll things back, is increasing its hostilities, such as its new threats against the UK. And this is being done under its new form of, quote, wolf warrior diplomacy. The idea of this is that the CCP, anytime it's criticized anywhere in the world right now, its new policy is to meet them head on and to criticize them, to attack them. And this is having an opposite effect in many countries. And the CCP is even being told this by its own advisors. But despite that, it is still doing this. And we've been seeing this taking place, where when the CCP goes against these countries and it criticizes, for example, Australia, when it criticizes New Zealand, when it threatens these companies for calling out the Chinese Communist Party, they respond by deepening the decoupling now taking place from China. Now, meanwhile, in the South China Sea, after the United States issued an official declaration that it does not recognize the CCP's claim to the region, there has been mixed pushback by surrounding countries. So first off, the Philippines for the first time called on the Chinese regime to comply with the 2016 ruling from The Hague that its claims in the South China Sea were not legal, and it threw out the CCP's claims of having, quote, historical rights over basically the entire region. Yet despite this, the Philippines and the CCP also reaffirmed their ties, and this is despite their disagreement again over the South China Sea. Now, meanwhile, Vietnam has taken a stronger stance against the CCP. And this is not uncommon for Vietnam. They've been pretty much at, at odds with the CCP for quite some time now, going back to even the end of the Vietnam War. Now, its foreign ministry spokeswoman said on July 15th, Vietnam welcomes the position of countries in the East Asia, internationally known as the South China Sea, that are in accordance with international law. As Vietnam has stated in the Declaration of the ASEAN 36 Summit, the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is the legal framework governing all activities in the sea. And the United States also stood with Vietnam and other countries in that area 
by dismissing the CCP's claims to the Vanguard Bank and other areas. Now, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said in a statement on the South China Sea on July 13th that, quote, the United States rejects any PRC, People's Republic of China, maritime claim in the waters surrounding Vanguard Bank off Vietnam, Laconia Shoals off Malaysia, waters in Brunei's EEZ, and Natuna Besar off Indonesia. Any PRC action to harass other states' fishing or hydrocarbon development in these waters or to carry out such activities unilaterally is unlawful. So what does this mean? Now, there is international pushback against the CCP. And the United States, I mean, one thing after the next, they're hitting the CCP with sanctions, calling out the CCP's illegal claims, going after the CCP's illicit actions. Whether it's economic theft, whether it's claims to the South China Sea, whether it's its abuses of its own people, for example, in Xinjiang or in Hong Kong currently, the United States is going after these one by one. And also, other countries seem to be joining in with it. We now have Vietnam pushing back against the CCP even harder. We now have the Philippines pushing back to some extent. The first time, for example, they've recognized this ruling that the CCP's claims of the South China Sea are unlawful, based again on that ruling. And also we see different pushbacks by Australia, different parts of the EU, the UK, many countries. And again, based on this different pushback against the CCP from all these different countries, rather than trying to put on a friendly facade, rather than trying to walk things back, the CCP is again pushing back even harder, again with this wolf warrior diplomacy. It is criticizing these countries, it is threatening these countries, and that is making things even worse for the CCP as it faces internal disaster, internal instability, and also again international pressure. Now in addition to the new national security laws on Hong Kong, which have again basically ended Hong Kong's autonomy, the CCP is creating a new data security law, of course on data, which is now working finalized this year. Now the draft of this is being criticized even internally for its vagueness, but according to TechNote, quote, the draft law reaches further in scope, allowing China to take legal action against those seeking to harm the country's national security and interests. It will also create, quote, corresponding measures against countries that limit data flows and technology investment into China. And it will also create additional regulations and requirements on data. Now, what does this really mean? Quote, again, allowing China to take legal action against those seeking to harm the country's national security and interests. Now, we can interpret this in line with the new, say, Article 38 of the national security law, which is being criticized of the CCP basically expanding its legal abilities to any country in the world, where it could charge any individual in any country for violating the CCP's own laws. In other words, if you criticize the CCP, if you say, support democracy in Hong Kong, you could be labeled a terrorist by the CCP. And if you travel to China, as many different travel advisories are now stating, you could face arrest. The CCP is extending its legal reach to every corner of the world with the national security law. And with this new draft law, the CCP is doing this as well on its data side. Again, going after anything that harms the CCP's national security interests. And what does the second part really mean? Again, creating corresponding measures against countries that limit data flows and technology investment into China. While we've seen the CCP doing very similar things in almost every regard, it's these tit-for-tat regulations. These tit-for-tat, say, sanctions, for example, where if U.S. officials, as they have done recently, go after the CCP for its abuses of human rights of the Muslim Uyghurs, for example, they will, say, sanction these U.S. officials for doing so, as they recently did against three U.S. lawmakers and an ambassador. Or as we recently saw with Australia, for example, where it put different travel warnings on China, saying you would face potential arrest if you travel there, the CCP put similar travel warnings on Australia. Now, the CCP, again, has this method when it comes to these things of accusing others of what they themselves have done. If they are accused, they will accuse you of doing the same thing. And it seems that their new data law has a requirement on this, that we may see even more of this from the CCP. And meanwhile, China and Iran are working to finalize a deal for a 25-year partnership, which would have China import, quote, substantial levels of Iranian oil and expand cooperation on alleged anti-terrorist operations. This is, of course, despite Iran being one of the world's largest sponsors of terrorism. Now, the Chinese Communist Party and Iran have always worked closely together, and the deal really just continues much of what they've already been doing. But we should understand this in the broader context. 
when something like this happens between the Chinese regime and say something that's already doing, if it's already involved in something, but they make a new deal, a new public statement on it, the big question isn't on the deal itself, but instead on why they have decided to state it publicly. Now we should consider the timing and the circumstances of this. Now in terms of context, Iran has openly criticized the Chinese Communist Party for its handling of the coronavirus. You might remember reports saying that Iran was actually hit pretty hard by the virus, and especially the Iranian leadership was hit very hard by the virus. And at the same time as that, the CCP is facing pressure from all corners of the world, all these different countries pushing back against it, whether they're calling for investigations, whether they're criticizing it for what is done in Hong Kong, whether they're going after it for its abuses of the Muslim Uyghurs, and so on. And so this move could simultaneously, in my analysis at least, be the CCP trying to repair ties with Iran, building alliances amid growing international pressure, and publicly undermining the United States by relieving economic pressures on Iran. And in other news, Reuters is claiming in an exclusive report the Trump administration will soon end a 2013 agreement that was made between the United States and China on auditing authorities. And again, another chapter in this U.S. pushback against the CCP, another layer to this. Now, this is seen as the U.S. possibly going after Chinese companies that have been using this agreement to get around U.S. laws on disclosure. Now, a bit of background on this. Reuters states that, quote, it says, quote, the deal, again, this law that's now being rolled back, which set up a process for a U.S. auditing watchdog to seek documents and enforcement cases against Chinese auditors, was initially welcomed as a breakthrough in U.S. efforts to gain access to closely guarded Chinese financial information, and bestowed a mark of legitimacy on Chinese regulators. And it adds this, quote, But the watchdog, known as the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, has long complained of China's failure to grant requests, meaning scant insight into audits of Chinese firms that trade on U.S. exchanges. And so what does this mean? Now, remember what happened with Luck and Coffee. Remember what's happened recently with other Chinese companies that have been lying about their data, for example, now the Chinese Communist Party can report data saying whatever it wants on its side, and the U.S. has very little access to that data. And so as we saw with Luck and Coffee, where it was lying about its financial records, the CCP can claim data on the U.S. side while concealing it on its side. And if this is really rolled back, this could very likely expose corruption and foul play among Chinese companies that are operating abroad. And even more so, this could also even the playing field for different companies by requiring Chinese companies to play by the same rules as they are. And with that said, folks, again, we're broadcasting Monday through Friday, five days a week. And also, if you want to support this channel, we do have a Patreon. You can find the link to it in the description below. And also, for our Patreon supporters, every Sunday I'll be doing a live Q&A. So again, be sure to tune in for that. And also, folks, if you want to really support this channel, please also like and subscribe. It really helps us. And if you can, please tell a friend or family member about the show as well. Of course, that said, please take care of yourselves, stay healthy, and stay free.